So we've started drawing Lewis structures in class, and I thought I'd sit down and make this little video to help maybe guide you through a few examples of some common ones, some exceptions to the rule. I know some of you are really worried about the exceptions to the octet rule, and just to give you more um, experience in kind of how I solve these problems, uh, given the rules that I've given you in class. Your book has a, an approach as well. Uh, you may have learned a different way in high school, and all those are fine. We just want to make sure that you, you've, you've integrated some way into your thinking and preparation so that you can be able to draw these rather quickly and accurately on the next exam. So let's go ahead and jump in. And so if we look at this first one, uh, this is a pretty simple one, right? And you look at this and you say, okay, well, it's F2. Um, and how do we how do we start to, to get at this? And so the first thing you want to do is you want to do what I call an electron count. And that's really critical because you need to think about what are the um, number of electrons that you have to account for when you draw the structure. And bonding is what we're going to be looking at here, right? One of the most important things about Lewis structures is that they tell us the bonding, the skeletal structure, right? The connectivity of how things are held together in this molecule. And so in order to do that, we have to know what electrons we're dealing with. And the electrons that deal with bonding are known as the valence electrons. These are gonna be the outermost shell electrons in an atom. Remember, we just finished doing electron configurations, and so this should be pretty fresh in your mind. So if you think about fluorine, right, we've got two of these, but if we take one at a time and we look at fluorine, you'll look at the periodic table and you can go across the periodic table either in the electron configuration or just by counting, and you'll see that fluorine is a halogen. So it has seven valence electrons. That's really important. And since we have two of these, that means we're going to have 14 valence electrons. And so we have to be able to account for all of these when we think about our structure. This is really important. You may think it's kind of a silly step, but it's really important because if you don't know how many electrons you have to account for, you can make a mistake and it can cost you when it comes to your structure. If you get too far ahead of yourself without thinking about the basics, it can be a problem. The other thing, if you look at kind of the rules I gave you, you look at this compound, this is, um, fluorine's clearly a non-metal, and so if you go back to our old skill set, this is going to be what we call a covalent, or if you'd rather call it a molecular compound, right? So this is really important. You've got to be able to know the difference between molecular and ionic, because it's really going to be, um, quite significant as we look at these problems. So let's think about this. So we've got 14 electrons. And so the next thing I want to do is I want to look at this and say, okay, um, I've got two fluorines. And so it makes sense that in order to form this compound, right, they have to at least be bound to each other or else it would fall apart and it wouldn't exist, right? You have to have at least one bond that's going to hold this thing together. And again, you have to remember that when we draw this line, this line, right? This is critical. This line equals a covalent bond, right? That's the sharing of how many, right? Two electrons. You've got to remember that. So if we've got 14 minus two for this one bond, that means we've got 12 electrons left over. And so now if you look at the rules or if you kind of just internalize it or the way I do it, you say, okay, I've got two electrons. I've got 12. I need to go and give each atom a full octet. And so if we look at this fluorine on the left here, we see that it is sharing two electrons in that bond. So in order to get an octet, we have to add one, two, three, four, five, six. And now if you look at this, boom, this fluorine has an octet. And so if we use those six electrons, we have six left, and it's probably pretty obvious to you at this point, uh, if, if due to nothing else but symmetry, we've got six electrons that have to go over here and now we've got two four six we also count the two that are shared so that removes the last six and now we've accounted for all of those electrons and we've got this really nice diatomic fluorine that is bound with a single bond and remember this is really important we call this bond here this is a bonding pair right that's bonding pair and then we've got boom we've got one we've got two We've got three, we've got four, we've got uh, five, and we've got six. And these are not doing anything, at least in this model. And so we call these the non-bonding, right? The non-bonding electrons. And what's another word for non-bonding? Sometimes we call these lone pair electrons. And that's really important. So we've got one set of bonding, one pair, right? Because that line, right? Remember, I'm gonna say it one more time. That line equals 
two shared electrons, right? That's really important. You've got to remember that. And so there you go. We've got single bond, two fluorines, 14 electrons, full credit. So let's go on to something a little bit more challenging, shall we? Okay, so we got some H2S here. And H2S, uh, you might think it's going to be a little bit crazy, but we're going to say approach it the same way. So you look on the periodic table and you see sulfur and you count from left to right to figure out how many valence electrons you have for sulfur. And that's going to be six. And you'll notice sulfur is in the same column as oxygen, which often has, um, you know, they have the same, very similar chemistry at times, right? So that whole column will have six valence electrons. And then hydrogen, you should remember, hydrogen only has one valence electron, but we have two of them. So that's going to give us a total of eight electrons really important that you do that I, I can't stress this enough i know you may get confident you may think you're like you know the chemistry chat or whatever but you gotta you gotta cover your bases you gotta get this right so let's go ahead and think about this well i'm gonna look at this and say the sulfur's got to be in the middle hydrogen is never in the middle for anything we're gonna do because hydrogen can never form more than one bond uh, for most examples that we're gonna ever see and so we're gonna put that sulfur in the middle but remember we're going to have to at least connect it to the hydrogens in some way or it's going to fall apart. So we're going to put a single bond here. And I should back up a little bit and make sure we remember that this is going to be a molecular, right? This is a molecular compound or a covalent compound. It's not ionic. So we're going to say this is molecular. And if it's molecular, that means it's okay to use covalent bonds to share electrons. Really important. So if I've drawn two here to connect it, I've now got to remove those from my total, and that only gives me four electrons left. And so then we're gonna go around the outside to give everybody an octet, but very quickly you should remember, right? Hydrogen's a little bit weird. It's really, really small. It's electrons only occupy that 1s orbital. And so in this case, we don't have to put any electrons here because hydrogen is perfectly happy sharing the two electrons in that bond. And so it has what we call a duet hydrogen does not need an octet. So it's perfectly happy with just two, count them two electrons shared with the sulfur. Same thing with the hydrogen on the other side. But when we get to the middle, sulfur is gonna be different, right? Sulfur is a bigger atom. It's gonna want that octet rule. And so we have one, two, three, four electrons bound up in those bonding pairs. So sulfur can claim all four and we've got four electrons. If all the hydrogens are happy, now we take those remaining four and we're gonna put them on the sulfur. And if we've put those on there, we've removed four, we have none left over, we've accounted for all of our electrons. And so you can see here that sulfur does indeed have an octet with two bonding pairs and two non-bonding or lone pairs. So that's, that's pretty happy. Now I wanna contrast this one with uh, a one, our first ionic example, right? KBr is ionic. And whenever you get an ionic compound, it can be a little tricky the first time you see them, but it's really important that you remember a metal and a non-metal that's ionic. And in this case, these are a collection of ions. In this case, the potassium. You might say, well, how did the potassium become positive? Well, if you think about it, potassium would have had one electron in its valence shell. And if you've got bromine, neutral bromine, before it becomes anionic, right? What did that look like? Well, it looked like any other halogen in that it's going to have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven electrons. It wants that octet so it can go over here and it can grab the electron from potassium and steal it away. And now it has an octet and it has eight, right? That's an octet, but it had seven before and now it gained one more and it becomes the anion bromide, whereas potassium loses its electron and becomes um, plus. And if you think about why this might happen, it's because it's really easy to gain or lose an electron, become isoelectric or have the ele same electron configuration as a noble gas. So in this case, we never, right? Don't ever, 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 ever do this. It is not covalent. Do not draw lines showing me that they're sharing electrons because they don't. Instead of sharing, they become ions and you have two separated cation positive charge anion negative charge and they are only attracted because opposite charges attract due to columbic attraction that's really important so there's no sharing of electrons they do not draw that because that'll be a great way to lose some points and not show that you understand what's really going on so salts ionic let the name guide you into ions really important now 
We could have salts, however, that contain polyatomic ions, and this is nothing new for us. So this is ionic, this is a salt, and at first you may be confused because you don't see a metal, but remember that NH4, right, NH4 plus is one of those polyatomic ions that you needed to remember way back in exam one. And its counter ion then is chloride. And chloride, of course, had seven electrons, but it stole an electron and became negatively charged. And so it looks to me like chloride is done for us. However, when we look at ammonium, that is a polyatomic, right? I'm gonna write this one more time. This is a polyatomic, right? These you should know by now. And this is actually, if you look at just this ion, this ion by itself is made of shared covalent bonds. And so we can approach this individual ion as a separate problem. And this is how you break down these more complicated salt examples. And so if we do this, if we look at NH4 plus, which is really important, we're gonna say nitrogen, right? If you look at the valence electrons of nitrogen, you look at the periodic table and you count over, it's gonna have five. And then each hydrogen is gonna bring one and there's four of those, right? So you can look at it that way. And then finally, you have to account for the positive charge, which means you're gonna remove one, right? Because positive means it's missing one of its electrons. And you could say, well, where did that electron go? Well, it went to the chloride, right? To become from to go from chlorine to chloride. And so here we have five plus four minus one, right? What do we got here? We got a total of eight. And again, you approach this the same way as we did the one before it. You take the nitrogen and it's gotta be in the middle. And let's go ahead and at least put one bond to hold this thing together. And if you look at that, you say each of those bonding pairs, a bond here, bond here, bond here, bond here, each of those is two electrons, right? You gotta remember that a line equals two electrons that are being shared. And if that's the case, two electrons, and we have four of those, four pairs, well, that's eight electrons. Boom, we're out of electrons, and that's okay because if we go around, the hydrogens are perfectly stable, perfectly happy, having that single line with the two electrons being shared, and then we're good. We don't have to put anything else. And then if we double check, we can see the nitrogen here has one, two, three, four bonding pairs. So it can basically claim all four bonds, right? Which means it's claiming eight electrons, which gives the nitrogen an octet. And then remember that this thing is charged. So we need to go ahead and put a positive charge on this to show us that this is indeed an ion. But the cool thing about this is now, instead of just memorizing uh, the formula, we can actually look at the bonding of what these polyatomic um, ions actually look like, which is really quite important. Later on in the class, we'll talk about, well, where does this positive charge actually live? Is it here or here or here? Who knows, right? It's, it's probably located on the nitrogen, but we'll talk more about that later. All right, so we've got this um, sodium chlorate. And again, right away, we see a metal and a non-metal. So we say that's ionic. And we're gonna say, okay, in this case, the sodium is a plus. So that's our cation. And we don't have to worry much about that. That one's done. But we do have to worry about this chlorate. This chlorate is an anion. And if you think about it by itself, it is a collection of atoms that are bound with covalent bonds. So it itself has covalent bonds and we need to draw this out. So if you think about chlorine that has seven electrons, seven valence electrons rather, and then each oxygen has six, but we've got three of them. And then remember, we've got this anionic charge. So that's a plus one, that's an excess electron. So we gotta add that one. So we've got what, we've got 18 plus eight. That gives us 26, if I can count today. And there you go. So this might seem a little scary at first because there's a lot of electrons here, but it's not that bad. Let's go ahead and dive in. So this one's gonna be a little bit weird, but if you think about it, that chlorine kind of looks like it's the odd one out. So we're gonna make that the center one and we're gonna put an oxygen around here, an oxygen around here and an oxygen over here. And remember, we're gonna draw that initial bond because we have to have something to at least hold it together because otherwise it wouldn't even form a compound or it wouldn't even form an ion, right? It's gonna, it's gonna have one, two, three bonding pairs to just give it some basic integrity. And by doing that, we used up one, two, three, four, five, six electrons. We need to subtract that from our total. 
We've got 20 left. And the rules I gave you said to go around the outside, all m and style, right? So you go around the outside and you get one, two, three, four, five, six. There are six electrons. These are non-bonding pairs, lone pairs, added to this one bonding pair. So this oxygen now can claim eight electrons and you're all good. This one does the same thing. We've got one, two, three, four, five, six. We can count this bonding pair as the seventh and eighth. So this oxygen is pretty stable with an octet. And then the same thing down here on the bottom. We got six extras, counting those two in the, in the bond, and, and we're good there. So all the oxygens, I hope, will agree, have an octet. And in doing that, we use six, 12, 18. We need to subtract those out and we have two left, and of course, I think you're already ahead of me. Now we focus on the central atom, and we look at this chlorine. It has one, two, three, four, five, six, so it is really, really happy to get those extra two. That can give us an octet for the chlorine in the middle. And then finally, the last thing we wanna do is observe the fact that chlorate, as you know, has a negative charge, and we need to indicate that as such. So make sure you don't forget um, to cancel out the electrons there. I forgot to subtract the last two and then to add the charge. And you can just double check. Does every, everybody have an octet? They sure do. And we're good with that one. This next one's really quite laughably easy um, compared to the other two. This is again an ionic compound. The only difference is that you got this F2 and that's really important, right? Because the calcium is a two plus each fluorine or each fluoride rather is a negative one, but you had to have two to balance the charge. And so this one's really quite easy. There's nothing really to draw here. We say it's a calcium two plus, plus a fluoride one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight with a negative charge. And then also, right, since there are two of them, I'm gonna go ahead and draw it just to show you. Um, there you go. So we've got salt. And this one's really simple. You've got one calcium and two fluorides. But again, you'll notice, do not connect, right? Some of you might be tempted to get in a hurry and start doing all this mess, which is just utter madness. Don't, don't do this. Don't, please don't do that. That is not showing your understanding of what's, what's actually going on here. In fact, I wanna erase that, set it on fire and throw it away, it's so bad. Um, so we got one calcium cation and two of these fluorides, and that's calcium fluoride. Now, some of you were reading the book and you got a little bit confused about exceptions, right? So we've got some exceptions to the octet rule, right? Now, I wanna be really careful to back up here for a minute and say that Lewis structures are essentially a theory or a model of bonding. And you know, the famous saying goes that all models are wrong, but some are useful. And in this case, I think Lewis structures and Lewis theory of bonding is really quite important to learn when you're first starting out because it shows you what's connected to what. And that's really useful to think about in terms of how does a compound look in terms of its skeletal structure, really important. Plus Lewis theory is one of the easier ones. If you go on to other courses, you'll learn about something called molecular orbital theory and you know about Schrodinger. It's basically taking quantum mechanics and applying it to molecules, which is really exciting. But for right now, we're gonna start with um, we're gonna stay with Lewis, but I, I wanna start showing you that some theories, right, some models begin to show cracks in that when you have more and more examples that really aren't perfectly explained by the theory, it kinda, of, you know, turns on your spidey sense that maybe your theory needs to evolve or you need to come up with a new theory because if you start to see a bunch of examples that, that really make it hard to explain using your theory, you probably, you know, are getting to the limits of your theory and you need to come up with some new stuff, uh, some better theories. And so I hope we can agree that BH3 is covalent or um, molecular. I'm gonna use those words more and more um, interchangeably. And so if we look at this one, let's just do it the same way. Boron, if you look at boron on the periodic table, right, it's gonna have three valence electrons. And of course we know probably by now in our sleep that hydrogen has one each and we have three of those, right? Three of those, so we're gonna end up saying we've got six electrons. Right away, that should probably tip you off that maybe there's a problem here because we don't even have eight total in the compound. So getting somebody an octet is gonna be rather challenging. So we typically say this is an electron deficient species because it doesn't even have eight electrons, but let's go ahead and draw it out anyway. 
Now I'm going to go ahead and put boron in the middle because hydrogen can never be in the middle. And if you look at this right away, we say we've used one, two, three bonds to at least begin to put it together, to give it at least one bond to hold it together. Each of those bonds contains two electrons. And so we've used up all of our electrons, right? Because you would be tempted to say, okay, each of the hydrogens look pretty happy. They have a duet. They each have uh, no, no problems right there. But that boron, I would argue, right, it does not have an octet. You would love to put two more electrons there to give it an octet, but unfortunately, you ran out. You don't have any more. So in this case, boron will be what we call an exception to the octet rule because this BH3 does exist. But what the, the, the issue is in the real world, we call this electron deficient. It's lacking electron density. So this thing will love to form what we call dimers or... Uh, little um, you know chains of molecules or things like that because it really is craving more electron density so if it can find a molecule that has some extra electron density it will it will, it will partner up and, and steal some of that electron density away from its partner to, to help it overcome some of this this um, deficient uh, electron cloud deficiency and so we want to be really careful here to say even though this thing does exist it's not perfectly happy it will typically be transient it'll last for a small time or it will become a dimer uh, which happens in this case of bh3 it typically becomes a dimer which we're not going to really talk about today but boron is sort of the poster child for electron deficient species they do exist um, and sometimes you know it's okay because we want to share the diversity of chemistry with you and that everything's not quite as neat and tidy as we'd like it to be but the other thing, like I was alluding to before I started the example, maybe this shows us that uh, Lewis theory and the octet rule may not be the cutting edge way we understand how these things really bond and to give us a best picture. So um, if you go on to other classes, you'll learn things like molecular orbital theory, and it can really explain much more uh, in a much more sophisticated way why these things exist. But for right now, we realize that boron is indeed an exception to the octet rule and and there you go so this is an example of something that is electron deficient what happens if you have too many electrons so pcl5 this is a molecule that can exist right so this is molecular or we can say covalent right and we're going to go ahead and say that phosphorus right is in the same column as nitrogen so it's going to have five and then oh my goodness uh right chlorine has seven and we have five of those so, oh my goodness, isn't that like 35? And so we're gonna have 40 electrons. Wow, I think this is the most we've done so far. So that might scare you at first, but again, don't let it bother you. Just kind of move on and say, okay, I'm gonna use my same kind of uh, method, whatever method works for you. If you like the rules in your book, that's cool. If you like the rules that I gave you in my handout, that's cool too. But don't let these bigger numbers scare you. Just go ahead and say, okay, in this case, phosphorus is gonna be in the middle. And I've got to go ahead and connect these chlorines somehow. So I'm going to say I have to at least put a single bond in there. And that's really important. And so I've got one, two, three, four, five bonding pairs. So five times five, right, is 10. I'm sorry, uh, five times two, excuse me, is 10. And I have 30 left. That's 30 electrons. And so now I'm gonna use the exact same uh, procedure I've done before. I'm gonna go around the outside, around the horn, and give each chlorine an octet. If it already has two, I only have to add six. So one, two, three, four, five, six. That gives this chlorine an octet. These are all the same, so I can just kind of save some time and go around. I've given that one an octet. I'm gonna give this one an octet. I'm gonna give this one, it's like Oprah, you get an octet, you get an octet, you get an octet, all this crazy stuff, right? So how many electrons did I use? I had five chlorines, I gave each six, even I can do that. So that is all of my electrons. And so boom, look at that. Uh, all the chlorines are happy, right? All the chlorines are stable, they all have an octet. I hope you agree. But what do you notice about the phosphorus? This is the opposite of the boron example, right? In this case, the phosphorus is not electron deficient, Oh, no, no, no. In this case, the phosphorus has an overabundance, right? It has an overabundance of electrons. It has not an octet, but it has 10, right? One, two, three, four, five bonding pairs. So that phosphorus is going to have what we call um, an expanded octet. An expanded 
expanded octet, right? This is the opposite. Instead of having too few electrons, it has too many. But here's a trick. Phosphorus, if you look on the periodic table, phosphorus is one of the, it's it's not in the first row, right? Nitrogen's right there in the first row. And the, if you go down, the and we'll talk about this later in the course, the further you go down, the bigger the orbitals are, the bigger the atom is. And so in that case, you can accommodate more electrons because you're bigger, you can spread them out. Those minimize those repulsions. And so in this case, bigger elements like phosphorus or xenon or iodine, you see this with like arsenic and all kinds of big elements. Uh, they can accommodate more than octet uh, for a variety of reasons. But again, I would, I would kind of, again, begin to give you a little bit of a spoiler that we're starting to see that Lewis theory is one of the first theories to come up uh, in terms of the historical development of how we understand bonding. But the problem with that is it doesn't have all the nuance of like Schrodinger's equations and quantum mechanics that can explain these things in more detail. And so if you want to learn more about that, take the next course and you'll, you'll really get the full answer. But for right now, know that this is what we call an expanded octet for big elements. If you get more than eight electrons, it's okay for these exceptions. All right, and then here's a monster. Look at this one. Remember we talked about the noble gases and how they're they're really, you know, typically shy away from forming compounds because they're inherently stable, but that doesn't mean you can't force them to make compounds. Um, in this case, uh, you know, xenon uh, tetrafluoride is, is definitely a molecular compound, so let's go ahead and establish that. It's a molecular or covalent, however you want to call it. And so here we're going to say xenon, right, it brings eight electrons to the table. And we've got four times seven, right? And so that's 28. So this one gives us what, 36 electrons if I can count today. So we got 28, that looks right, okay. So we're gonna put the xenon in the middle. I think it's just, to me, noble gas compounds are pretty badass. It's, if you're gonna, you know, uh, slap xenon hard enough to make it bond, man, that's, 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 some, that's some crazy conditions, but um, if we look at this, we're going to have to bond the fluor for fluorine somehow, right? So let's go ahead and just start like we've done before. And again, I hope you're starting to see this pattern. You got to at least make a skeleton, uh, you know, bond it somehow because it's got to be connected somehow. And so in this case, we've used one, two, three, four bonding pairs. So that means we've used up eight electrons. And if we take um, that, we're down to uh, 28, right? 36 minus 8 is 28. And so now we're going to do the same thing. We go around the outside and we're going to give each of the fluorines first an octet. And it takes six electrons, right? One, two, three lone pairs and one bonding pair. So that gives that fluorine eight because it's that bonding pair is shared, right? And then here we go. We've got this one has an octet now. And again, this is trivial. These are so easy because they're exactly the same. We give each one six, and then with that bonding pair, boom. So we've got six times uh, four, so that's 24 electrons we use, and there are four electrons left. And you might be a little confused and say, well, Dr. Porter, where are we gonna put those? Because fluorines are all stable, they've got their octet. Well, fluorine's pretty small, so you're not gonna really, you know, anything in that first row, you're really not gonna expand the octet. You need something big like a phosphorus or a arsenic or an iodine or oh what's big well xenon's pretty big and so guess where we're putting those four electrons yeah you guessed it we're gonna put those four electrons right smack dab in the center here on that xenon so look at this we've got one two three four electrons bound up in the bonding pairs and then we've got one two three four we got two electron two lone pairs with four electrons so that that xenon is so large that it can actually, in this case, explained from Lewis theory, um, take on 12 electrons. So you want to talk about an expanded octet? That is an expanded octet, my friends. That is that is a monster. So again, another hyper, um, you know, hypervalent or um, expanded octet example. Again, those three that we just did um, are exceptions to the octet rule. And I wanted to do them just to kind of give you some examples because they do exist. These are real compounds. So now what I want to do is transition a little bit from single bonds to double bonds. And, and I think cyanide is a really good example. So again, cyanide, right? Even though this is a polyatomic, 
it is bound through covalent bonds. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, okay, well, carbon has four, nitrogen has five valence electrons, and then please don't forget this um, anion, this plus one, we gotta add that one, and we get 10 electrons. Now, this is a good point. Um, whenever we do Lewis structures, you're always going to have pairs of electrons, right? So if you ever get an odd number, it's a good hint that you've probably messed up your counting. So always make sure you get an even number before you start your problem. We're going to put the carbon here and we're going to bond it to the nitrogen. So we've got something that looks like that, right? We always start with a single bond to give us a skeleton. And so we got to subtract that pair of electrons. And now we're down to eight. And it doesn't matter what side you go on next, but let's just say I'm gonna give the carbon an octet. So I'm gonna go two here, two here, two here. This carbon looks pretty stable. I've used six electrons, I've got two. Um, now I gotta deal with this nitrogen. I put two over here, and very quickly I think you realize, even though the carbon looks pretty stable, the nitrogen's not very stable. It's not very happy because it only has four electrons um, even with sharing that bonding pair. So that's that's not good. So what you can do instead is you can say, okay, well, maybe these guys can share more equitably. And we can say, okay, this, this lone pair over here is doing really nothing right now. And so instead of being bonding, maybe it can get off the bench and do some work and become a bonding pair by jumping into that bond. So let's see what happens here. We, we turn this one into a bonding instead of a non-bonding, and how does that help? Do we agree that the carbon still has one, two, three, four locked up in the bonding, one, two, three, four locked up in the non-bonding, so that's still an octet. The nitrogen situation got much better. It was at four, but now it's at one, two, three, four, five, six. That's, that's some progress. Well, if that's progress, let's go ahead and take this lone pair and add it to the bonding mix. So it goes from a non-bonding to a bonding pair. And if we look at this now, we see that this carbon still has one, two, three, four, five, six electrons locked up in the bonding, two locked up in the non-bonding. That's still eight. If you go to the nitrogen, it is much more stable now. It's got two electrons locked up in the anti or in the um, excuse me, the lone pair or the non-bonding. And then it's got one, two, three, four, five, six for a total of eight. So now We've got an octet on carbon and an octet on nitrogen. And then don't forget that cyanide is an anion, so we better put the negative charge here to show it. And there you go. So if I draw it a little bit more cleanly over here, I can show that this is your first example of something that has a triple bond, which is pretty, I think, pretty cool. And that's what cyanide looks like. But I want to be really careful to, to caution you. It gets really exciting to draw double bonds and triple bonds, and it's a lot of fun to do, but but use caution, right? Don't just start drawing them because you think it looks cool. That will, that's a great way to miss a problem. You only want to make double bonds when you have to. And when do you have to? When somebody, when you run out of electrons, right? We put these two electrons here, I forgot to subtract, and we were out, right? So we didn't have any more electrons. And the nitrogen, if you remember, if you, I mean, to kind of go back in time here, we had carbon and a nitrogen, right? With very asymmetric distribution, and even the carbon was happy, right? The nitrogen was, was only half an octet. And so we couldn't just leave it like that. We had to do something. And this is the only time you need to go to the last resort of making multiple bonds when you have to begin to take non-bonding electrons and make them participate to give us something where everybody has an octet. So I hope that kind of gives you an idea of when do you need to use double bonds? or triple bonds. We're almost done, last couple. So carbon dioxide, right? This is a major component of greenhouse gases. And if you wanna think about climate change and things like this, again, we remember this is a covalent or a molecular compound. And carbon has four valence electrons. We've got two oxygens, each of those brings six, right? So I believe we've got a good old 16 electron total here. We're gonna put the carbon in the middle and again, I want you to see that I am not immediately jumping to draw double bonds. That's not what I'm doing. I'm doing the same way I've done it before. I'm gonna draw it just to connect it, to hold it together with a single bond. 
and then I need to subtract those four electrons to get me back down to 12. And now I'm going to go around the outside. I'm going to say, okay, one, two, three, four, five, six for that one. That's got an octet. That guy looks pretty happy. One, two, three, four, five, six. That's good. We've used up 12. Guess what? We don't have anything left for carbon. So carbon is in the same situation that nitrogen was in the previous example. And so in this case, what do we do? We say, okay, carbon does not have an octet. So maybe one of these pairs can jump into the game and form a double bond. So again, it goes from being a non-bonding pair to a bonding pair. And does this oxygen still have an octet? Yeah, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. We're still good, no problems there. This oxygen we didn't change, it's still got an octet. This carbon, unfortunately, still does not have an octet. So we need to do something, because it only has six. And in this case, just due to kind of the, the rule of symmetry, you know, kind of being symmetrical here, being equitable here, I'm gonna take one from the other side and have it contribute, and so we get this. And remember, when it contributes, it goes away from being a lone pair to becoming a bond, bonding pair, so now this oxygen has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. This one has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. They are both perfectly happy. We haven't hurt them at all. And this carbon now in the middle has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It now has an octet. So again, I can't emphasize this enough. If you wanna make um, something that has an octet or something that does not have an octet that needs an octet and you have no more electrons to give, then that's when you should, and, and only then that you should begin to think about making double bonds. And the way you make those double bonds is you convert a non-bonding pair to a bonding pair. Again, we have not changed the overall number of electrons. We've just simply shifted who is on the bench doing nothing, i.e. lone pairs, non-bonders, to ones that are participating in the bonds. All right, this last one is pretty cool. And so it's our probably biggest one we've seen. And again, um, you know, we're not going to stretch it too far with giant clusters, but this is another covalent or molecular example. And even though there's a lot of atoms here, I'm going to do it exactly the same way. And so with carbon, I've got four. For oxygen, I've got six. And then finally, I've got two hydrogens. Each of those brings one. So that gives me, I believe, 12 electrons as well. Four plus six is 10, plus two is 12. Yeah, I can count today, that's good. I'm gonna put the carbon in the middle and I'm gonna connect everything with a single bond like I've been doing this whole video. And in this case, I've got one, two, three. That is three bonding pairs that remove six electrons. That gives me six left. Again, we don't worry about the hydrogens, right? The hydrogens are perfectly happy with a duet. Do not ever put lone pairs on hydrogen or I will find you. Don't do that. It, it, makes, it makes my heart cry just a little bit, so don't do that. So in case uh, we have extra, extra electrons, which we do, where do they have to go? They need to go to this oxygen, right? Because oxygen definitely, as we did in the last example, it wants an octet. And the only way you're gonna get that octet is by putting some non-bonding electrons there. We put six and look what happens. Wasn't this exactly what happened before? Yeah, yeah. And so now we see the oxygen is happy, the hydrogen is happy, this hydrogen is happy, but this carbon is not stable, right? Because it only has six electrons. So what are we gonna do? Exactly the same thing. In this case, we have carbon with no octet. It's, it's lacking an octet, but unfortunately we don't have any extra electrons to give it. We've run out. So in this case, and in this case only, we're gonna take one of these lone pairs and we're gonna get it off the bench and we're gonna make it bond. And when we do that, we remove it because we converted it from a lone pair to a bond. And now look what we have. This oxygen still has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. It's perfectly stable, perfectly happy. Hydrogen's happy, hydrogen's happy. Carbon now has one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight total electrons shared through bonding pairs. And that is a stable molecule. So I hope this is, uh, a good resource for you to think about how you might go about solving these kinds of problems. Um, we're, things will get more complicated from here, so it's really important that you start to think about um, getting these skills down as soon as possible because we're going to introduce things like polarity, formal charge, resonance, 
and I promise you it's going to build upon what we've just talked about today. So if you want extra help, um, seek out your, your peer tutors and SI. Um, I know the SI uh, you know sections are, are really helpful. Uh, the QSC is available in the evening, so go, go see the tutors there. And then also come see uh, your professors and get some help if you're still having trouble because I promise you, you got to get this stuff under your belt. You got to get confident because what's coming is going to build on this. And if you're not confident and you're still confused about this, your stress is going to go through the roof because you're going to feel confused and behind. And so don't let that happen. Okay, I, I think I've rambled enough here. I'll, I'll load this up and, and hopefully you can have this as a uh, tutorial to look back on as you need it. So hang in there, keep working hard, and Wabash always fights.